let's turn in our Bibles now to John chapter 10. And my text is going to be from verse 11 down to verse 18. And I want to speak with you about Jesus, the good shepherd. We're in the G's still, alphabetically, and titles of Christ. And here we come to Jesus, the good shepherd. And I want us to note the qualities of Christ as the good shepherd. Begin here in verse 11. And read down to verse 15. The Lord says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Here's one of those I am declarations. So he's not just saying I am a good shepherd, but I am the good shepherd. And any of the Jews who heard him at that time would have understood him to be speaking of himself as God because that was a quality reserved for God in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 40 and verse 11, it speaks of God being the shepherd of his people. And here the Lord says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep the hireling so the lord's comparing or contrasting himself as the good shepherd with all these others that were in the land in that day that were nothing but hirelings the hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep so there we begin to see the qualities of Christ as a good shepherd, not only as the shepherd of the sheep, but caring for the sheep, knowing them by name, knowing each one, and uh, better than they know themselves. And again, he repeats it in verse 14, I am the good shepherd, there it is, and know my sheep. You notice that sheep is an italic. I know those that are mine, would be another way of reading that and am known of mine, but as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So that's the first quality of Christ as the shepherd of the sheep, is that he lays down his life for the flock. And he says, I am the good shepherd. There's just no mistake here of what he was meaning because he came to fulfill all of the Old Testament types and pictures of a shepherd-like care for a people that the Father had given him, and that's illustrated in the Old Testament and particularly in that culture. Here our Lord announces himself as the good shepherd as opposed to the opposite which is described as the robber. So he would be the example of what it is to be the good shepherd as opposed to all others that are described as nothing but thieves and robbers. And really that's the way it is. There's a lot that run around even in our day that claim to be servants of Christ and yet they're nothing but thieves and robbers because... Rather than pray for the sheep, they pray on them. And rather than Christ receiving all the glory, they seek the glory for themselves. Being a shepherd was not a occupation that people sought after. A shepherd was very lowly. And in that particular culture, when you went by and saw them out there in the field, it required total dedication. They were out there with the sheep, not removed from them. And so not something that would necessarily seem to be a role that the Christ, the creator of the world, would would take to himself. But it shows to what extent Christ was willing to go in order to save that people that the Father had 
given him, even to the point of being willing to die for those sheep. Unlike so many that might have been taking care of sheep, and yet when they see the wolf coming, they flee. They care for their own souls and their own lives more than they do the sheep. But such was not the case with the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Latin language, the word for money is actually akin to the word sheep. Because to many of the first Romans, wool was their wealth. And their fortunes lay with their flocks. And so the Lord Jesus being our shepherd is our wealth. He's everything to his sheep and his sheep are everything to him. This is, it shows us his heart for his sheep. It says he gives his life for the sheep. That word gives actually is in the present tense. He continues to give of himself for the sheep. I know that he laid down his life to redeem his sheep, every one of them when he died and God justified them there at the cross, but even now he ever lives to intercede on behalf of each one for whom he paid the debt. So his eye is ever on his sheep. And we could say that he continues and is always giving of himself for these sheep. Stop and think about sheep. They're dumb animals. And some might not think they're even worth living that they're worth nothing but to be sacrificed. But here our Lord Jesus Christ came, gave his life physically, laid down his life to redeem his sheep, rose again, and has ascended on high where he ever lives now to represent them in glory. I don't know about you, but that's a comfort to me. When life gets a little bit rough down here, it seems like the storms and the enemy and all these things are against us, yet Christ ever lives to intercede. And that means to rule in his providence. That's an amazing comfort, too, to know that nothing touches one of Christ's sheep but what it comes through his hand. We're not just given up to fate, but we're in the hand of the Lord. And so as the good shepherd, we see here, first of all, that he lays down his life for his sheep. Secondly, he protects his sheep with his life. There it says that the hireling, when he sees the wolf coming, that he flees. That's there in verse 12. Leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth his sheep. That's what would be our case were we given over to men to be our protectors. That's why we're not to look to men. Don't ever elevate men above Christ. It's assumed here that any wild animal, here it's called the wolf, but also bandits, thieves, all of these were attacking sheep, threatening the sheep. And uh, the question is, well, how will the shepherd respond? Sometimes it may seem like he's removed, but he's not. The purpose of the wolf here is the same as the thief in verse 10. They're, they're both the same thing, wolf or thief, that they are the great foe of the sheep of Christ. In fact, that's who Paul warns against over there in Philippians, those that are grievous wolves and come among the sheep to devour, if they could, such as the environment of our lives in this world. But here's where we see that the good shepherd stands to represent his sheep and comes between those that would seek to devour the sheep or undo them. There's a blessed truth here, as you read later on in this chapter, that 
any that the Father has given to his Son. Those are his sheep. If you look further on, this is beyond my text, but it, it applies in John 10 and verse 26. He says to the Pharisees, ye believe not, why? Because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Don't get that backward. It's not saying, well, since you don't believe on me, then you can't be my sheep. He says, you believe not because you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And what? I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. It's not how you hold on. It's how he holds on to each one of his own for whom he came. Neither shall any man is an italic anything. There's no sin, there's no enemy, no Satan that can pluck any of the Lord's out of his hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And again, it says no man, but man is an italic. Nothing is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So that's what he's declaring here, not only as the shepherd of the sheep to lay down his life, but the shepherd of the sheep to protect those that the Father has given him. The bad shepherd, those are hirelings, the underlings, rather than defend the sheep. And uh, they think that somehow the flock exists for their benefit. You can listen to a lot of preachers today that name the name of Christ. They use his name, but they use it for their advantage. They really think that all of those that follow them are for their benefit. But here we see that the good shepherd, Christ being the good shepherd, lives and dies for the good of the sheep. He has but one view, and that is the good of the sheep. That's why he says there that the good shepherd lays down or sacrifices his life for the sheep, literally gives his life and knows his sheep. That means that word know means to know intimately. We don't even know ourselves as we ought to. But the Lord does and never casts anyone away. Everything is open and transparent before him. And uh, sometimes we use that generically, speaking of all of God's elect, all of his sheep, but he knows each one individually because he's made each one individually. And our personalities are different. That's why I say if you ever see sheep marching in lockstep in a field, like the military, you do a double take. That's just not how we are. We're prone to wander. And yet the Lord knows our wanderings. He knows each one of his own. And it, he says, and is known of them. And so that's a blessing there in verse 14. Again, the I am, I continue to be the good shepherd and know my sheep in and I'm known of mine. And then thirdly, third quality of the good shepherd here is that he acts in accord with the will of his father. He didn't come down here on earth as a lone ranger, so to speak, seeking whom he might gather up and follow him. No, he came according to the will of his father, just like it says there in verse 15. As the father knoweth me, even so know I the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. There's a perfect harmony between the will of the father and Christ's coming. It wasn't that the Father willed one thing and Christ came to do another. No. That's why he says there, I and the Father are one. In verse 30. And the Jews understood what he was saying. Because in verse 31 of John 10, it says, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. They would not have him to be who he said he was, and that is God in the flesh. 
Why was it necessary that he be God in the flesh? Well, only God can save. And so his coming to be the Savior required that he be God. But at the same time, he was to lay down his life. God cannot die. That's why a body was prepared for him. And blood shed unto death. It's not just blood shed, but blood shed unto death. All of this according to the Father's will. And our Lord was submissive to it. Him being the good shepherd meant that he came to fulfill the will of the Father. And uh, his being the good shepherd, and I've said before, where you see that word good, go ahead and put the name God because it's a derivative of the name God. He's God's shepherd. He's the God shepherd. He and the Father are one. And then fourthly, another quality here of Christ as the good shepherd, he assures that all of his sheep he must draw. That's what I love about the Christ of Scripture in that he's a successful Savior. To say that he came here to try to save every single person in the world and yet they end up in hell anyway, that's not a good shepherd. Can you imagine putting someone in charge of a flock of sheep and uh, coming to give an account? He says, well, I did my best, but we lost about 90% of the flock. Well, that's not a good shepherd. In fact, that demeans even who Christ is as the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd because he assures that every one of his sheep he will draw. If you and I today know anything of Christ, it's because we were known of him, first of all, and in his time he drew us. That's the only reason we can be called his sheep. And so he says in verse 16, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Now don't think that that's saying, well, there's the elect sheep and then there are others that he will give the opportunity to to believe. No, when he says other sheep I have which are not of this fold, he's talking about the Jewish fold. When he first came and began to call out his people, he was calling them out from among the Jews. That was the Jewish fold, the fold of Israel. But when he says here, that he must bring others, these other sheep, that has to do with Gentile sheep that he would cause to become one with that fold of Israel. So put it out of your mind that somehow there are two folds today, one for the Jews and one for the Gentiles. See, that's the popular teaching. Right now, because the Jews turned thumbs down on Christ, then he turned to the Gentiles. But afterward, they say he's coming back and he's going to begin to work with the Jews again. No, there's that's seen double. If you see double, go see the eye doctor. There's a problem. And if you're seeing double in Scripture, uh, you've got a problem because there is one, one fold. That's what he says here, doesn't it? Verse 16, them also I must bring. See, that was surprising news to even the Jews that the Lord had his sheep among the Gentiles that they considered to be nothing but dirty dogs. But he says, them also I must bring. Why? Because he would lay down his life and shed his blood for them equally as those that were his sheep among Israel. And it says, they shall hear my voice. He didn't say, I hope they will. No. And there shall be underscored as I have my Bible, one fold and one shepherd. There's only one people to God today, and it's not natural Israel. It's not national Israel. It's those from Jew and Gentile, bond and free, that Christ came and redeemed by his shed blood. We're not to imagine that he would just lay down his life for the Jews, exclusive of all other peoples. That's what the sense of the word world is. When it says in John 3.16, for God so or in this manner loved the world, he's talking about a world of Jews and Gentiles that he loved, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him, whosoever 
those who believe, whether Jew or Gentile. No distinction, because he's purpose that they believe. That's God's merciful design. That's the loving purpose of Christ, of God. Over here in Hebrews chapter 2. You see, people, they, they misinterpret these verses, not understanding God's purpose. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, where it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. People look at that and they say, ah, oh, see, he died for every single person in the world. That's not what it's saying. The expression there, taste death for every man, every kind of man, whether Jew or Gentile, and that he is purposed that they should be made part of this fold. In fact, he goes on to explain in verse 10. Another way of, of translating every man there is each one. But you have to read the following verse to get the context. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in what? Bringing many sons unto glory. Jewish sons and Gentile sons equally to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That's what he's talking about when he says that there will be one fold and one shepherd. Also look over in Ephesians chapter 2. And verses 13 through 17. These are clear portions of scripture. And if people misinterpret it, it's because they're blind. Here in Ephesians 2, look what he says in verse 13. Now, but now in Christ Jesus, that is by his death, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Who's he talking about? You who were sometimes far off. He's talking about the Gentiles. For he is our peace who hath made both one. The elect, Jew and Gentile, one. And hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. In that old temple, there was a wall by which if any Gentile came, even if they were a proselyte, who had converted to be a Jew, they couldn't pass that wall. They were not allowed into that inner court. But here the Lord says that middle wall partition has been torn down in Christ, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. That's not talking about some new man in here. That's talking about Christ being that new man. And so maketh peace. So when the Lord says there will be one flock, coming back here to my text in John 10, in verse 16, a fold of sheep is a part of the flock in its own structure and closure. And a shepherd might separate sheep into different groups to care for them better, but there is one flock and one shepherd. The Lord has determined where each one of his sheep dwell. I know sometimes we wonder, why is it that the Lord's purpose that we be scattered all over this world in, in small numbers many times? Well, it's lest our confidence should be in numbers and that our eyes be on the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So that's a very clear declaration of one flock, one shepherd, and uh, one, one fold. And then the fifth qualification, this will be the final one here, verses 17 to 18, is that as the good shepherd, Christ has the power of life and death. He's not just any ordinary shepherd that you'd walk by and look at and uh, out there in the rain and the elements taking care of some sheep. No. He says in verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So here we see our Lord Jesus Christ declaring himself to be 
the one with the power over life and death. Why? Because he is God. And even as the Father, he says, loves me, therefore doth my Father love me. That love is from everlasting to everlasting. And from before the foundation of the world, he was there with his Father. And uh, all that the Father purposed, he the Son was in oneness and agreement with that he should come and pay the sin debt for his people. That's why he came. We can talk about him having loved his sheep, but he loved his father and therefore came and laid down his life for his sheep. But not to die as a martyr, but he says here that I may take it again. And then he declares that that power to take it again was in himself. We talk about the Father having raised him from the grave, but here, and that's true, but here he declares that I might take it again. There's no mere man that could ever die and then give life to himself, but our, our Lord did. And uh, in that sense, we can say that the Lord Jesus raised himself from the dead, but in accord with the will of his Father. He had the power to lay it down, and he had the power to take it up again. And it wasn't any man that took his life. That's why when they came to that point to break his legs, to try to speed up his crucifixion, because they wanted him off the cross by before sundown, that he was already dead. He had already commended his soul to his father. And he says, this command I have received from my father. If you don't have a salvation where God the Father has done the purposing and God the Son has done the fulfilling, then you don't know salvation. This command have I received of my Father. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ was completely voluntary. He laid down his life of himself, but it was in direct obedience. That's the command there, obedience of his father. This was not some suicide that he took his life, but rather a submission right down to the time when he cried with a loud voice, it is finished. That was purposed from before time and accomplished exactly. That's an amazing thing when you think about it. <laughs> think before time and then the uh, working of history all the way down to that particular hour and second being exactly the commandment that he had received of his father. And just like he received that commandment that he should lay down his life, so the commandment was to take up his life again, being raised again. He was delivered for our offenses or because of them and raised again for or because of our justification. That's where it all took place. That's the commandment he received of the Father. And if you don't think they didn't understand what he was saying, verse 19, there was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings. And then all the way down to verse 31, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. That same enmity is there today by people who will not have Christ to have all the glory and salvation. But if the Lord has taught us, we love to give him the glory, even as the Father gives him the glory.